Welcome. Welcome. Um, this is one of the Public Law Center seminars. We try and do this once a month. Um, we've stopped doing them in December because nobody wants to come to a seminar over the holidays. Um, can you hear me? It needs to be a little louder. Okay. I'm Helen Kavanaugh Stotts. I'm the director and the attorney at the Public Law Center, which is located right across the hall. We have information on any matters except for family law. We're open 8 to 4, Monday through Friday. And we're very fortunate to have with us today Sheila Van Dyne Romero, who's a local attorney, and she's going to give us a presentation on estate planning. So thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see everybody. Um, I can tell you first a little bit about myself. I uh, uh, am currently practicing in Grass Valley, California, and I'm also practicing in Reno, Nevada. So I can practice in both states. Um, and previously, I worked for a long time in the Bay Area at a, a big firm and then um, worked for a judge for a couple of years, off with kids and so forth, and then came on up here to Grass Valley. Uh, we're uh, going to be building a house here, and we're really looking forward to uh, uh, making this our home. So it's a nice area to practice in. Um, I have provided you with some folders. If everybody doesn't have them, uh, you can give me a call. I think there's some business cards around, and I'll be happy to send one out to you. Um, there's a few pamphlets that the State Bar puts out. Do I need a will? Do I need a trust? Uh, I Xeroxed a couple of probate code sections that are relevant to the costs of going through a regular probate. Um, and also just a uh, informational sheet, which is kind of the first step in figuring out your estate plan. There's also a, uh, another thing put out by the bar. There's a few copies out there. I'm not sure how many or if they spread around. But just a guide for seniors in the law, medical issues, legal issues, things like that. It's a good publication. So. Um, I'm going to run this fairly informally. If there's a topic I bring up that you really need to ask a question on, feel free to raise your hand and we'll, we'll talk about it at that point. Uh, sometimes waiting until the end, you forget what you really wanted to know about. So uh, first of all, I think people sometimes have misconceptions about what estate planning entails. They think, oh God, I've got to go to an attorney, I, I've got to figure out everything. I've heard about these trust things. They sound expensive, but nobody wants to go through probate. They've heard things about probate being a very convoluted and expensive process. So I'm here today. I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit um, and just tell you some of the things I know about the system. First of all, everybody's heard about wills. That's kind of the the big ticket item that everybody knows about that somebody needs to have a will. Some people probably heard about holographic wills. That's a will that you can write by hand. Usually uh, that's not a good idea. It's probably better to go ahead and, and contact an attorney and get an idea, a rough idea of what kind of estate planning you need. In general, an estate plan is more than just a will. And I'll uh, tell you that there are about five key questions that you want to answer and address with your estate planning. First of all, what are your assets? Um, and what is their approximate value? Okay, uh, the second one would be, who do I want to get those things when I die? And when? Do I want to perhaps extend the time frame and control when a certain person receives assets? Or, or my house, or my money? Is somebody too young? Is somebody having some type of issues that would prevent the money being used in an appropriate fashion? So you want to defer it a little bit. Another question would be, let's say, let's say you get ill. Let's say you go into a coma for a couple of weeks. Let's say you have a stroke, a mild stroke, and need a few, a few months to recover. Who's going to handle the paperwork, the bills, the uh, payments of your mortgage, your rent, while you're incapacitated. Another thing is, 
If you have minor children, generally there's two groups of people who are interested in estate planning. Ones who are, um, you know, just starting a family, they've got some kids, they're worried, oh my gosh, if I, if I pass away or I become incapacitated, who's going to take care of the kids? And another group is people who are older and they have adult children that they want to ensure receive what's due to them or other people in their lives that are important to them, they want to be sure receive their assets. Um, another thing is if you get into a situation where you ill, there's something called a health care directive. You guys have probably all heard about that with the whole Terry Schiavo thing. Before that, it was Qu Ann Quinlan. Um, but even think of it this way. Do you guys remember that miner who went into uh, you know, work one day, very young, and then came out a couple days later with brain injuries that had to uh, be treated for several months? He was probably not able to handle his personal affairs, write checks, and so forth for several months there. His wife joint checking account, but what if he didn't? There may have been problems there. So any, any person needs to think about who's going to make, number one, decisions for me if I cannot, and number two, who's going to make those decisions about my health care if I can't make my decisions about health care. Typically, if you're really in a serious situation with a, you know, an automobile accident or something like that, you're not going to be talking to the doctors. You're going to want somebody in your family or some friend to be able to come in and speak to the doctors about what to do with you. And you know, I don't know if any of you have been to a hospital lately, there are a lot of restrictions. You're, even sometimes your children have a hard time calling in and asking, you know, how's mom doing? Uh, let's talk about the procedure. They don't want to talk to you because there's different legal forms that all need to be filed. So if you appoint someone, who's authorized to talk to the doctor, that, that makes for a lot of, uh, a lot better situation in the long run. Now, you guys, first of all, how many people here, I mean, I know you're all coming here today, which is a good first step, but how many people have a will or have, have thought about anything, ha have done a trust before? Okay, that's good. And um, for the rest of you, hopefully I'll, uh, there's two different things. One, if you have done a will or a trust, in general it's a good idea to have someone take a look at that on maybe an annual or every couple of years to make sure it's either funded or make sure that things haven't changed, a beneficiary has changed, your relationship with someone you wanted as a trustee has changed. If, um, you know, for the other people here, you want to get um, started, and one of the easiest things to do to get started is to determine what uh, your assets are, to make a list. The yellow uh, pamphlet in your handbook is a way that you can get started making a list. Just compile the information. A lot of people don't even do that. They're dealing with papers, uh, bank boxes, keys, uh, um, uh, life insurance policies all over the place because it's, it's kind of a pain in the neck getting organized. And actually, when you do prepare a binder, um, it's good to keep everything in one place fairly securely. And actually, it feels kind of good because it's, it's like, getting a real job done and it, and it provides a lot of security and, and simplification for people who frankly if there is a, a death in the family are going to be grieving and they're not going to be um, uh, as, a, as able to handle looking for paperwork and such. Um, now who needs estate planning? I think everybody needs something. I don't agree that everybody needs one of those big trusts where you come in and you've got to do an A-B trust and there's some tax consequences because frankly some people's estates aren't big enough to merit that. Um, some people might just need a will. Let's say you're you know, 25 years old, you're just out of college, most likely you don't have a house, you don't have a lot of savings, you probably just need a simple will, maybe a health care directive at that point. If, you're, uh, if you bought a house, if you live in California, the house has probably gone up in value. You're dealing with a more complicated situation. At that point, your estate gets to the point you probably will need a t trust. It gives you a little bit more control over how things are going to be distributed. And as I'll get into later, you avoid a lot of the costs associated with probate. Um, so basically, the size of your state, estate changes what type of estate package is going to be good for you. Um, I think everybody across the board needs a health care directive. 
okay? Big estate, little estate, no money, anything, you need a health care directive. So as to avoid uh, situations that you don't want to be involved in in the future, such as, uh, you know, a tube, if you don't want something like that, health care directive will set forth your desires. Um, everybody probably needs a durable power of attorney for property management. That's actually, it's a fairly long uh, document, although a lot of it is boilerplate language, but it allows someone to make decisions for you if you're incapacitated by any kind of an illness. Um, then you have a choice of a will or a trust as the bulk of your estate plan. Um, there are different uh, wills are generally if you're doing for a single person cheaper at the outset to make a will but a lot of times you get more control with a trust so maybe the extra money you spend forming a trust and sometimes you can do a joint trust with a husband and wife or a, uh, a domestic partner situation um, then you have a little bit more control. Now with uh, regards to a trust, typically you'll have a backup will as well. So there's, that's, that's basically the, the different types of documents. Um, so does, uh, what type of things do people worry about transferring over? What, what are your assets? House, car, tractor? Okay. 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 Who takes care of minor children? All right. Uh, you need to appoint someone to do that. And uh, typically, you appoint a guardian of the person and of the children's estate because a lot of times, if the children are less than 18, well, all the time in California, they are not recognized by the state as being able to live on their own. So that's very important. If you do have minor children, or let's say you have uh, handicapped kids that need care later on in the game, you really need to set up a, a trust for that and, and appoint a trusted friend, relative to look after them. A lot of people, just as an aside, a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm going to use my brother and his wife. Okay, that's a great idea. They probably are fairly bonded with the kids. But, unfortunately, um, people do go through divorces. Uh, I don't know what the percentages are lately. You know, it's nice when you don't, but I mean, that is sort of a fact of life. So it's probably better just to appoint the brother, and then they'll reap the benefits of having the brother and the wife. Typically, it's better to have like one person, in my opinion, because you don't want the kids uh, getting involved in any kind of uh, custody battle that they don't need to go through. Um, otherwise, you can appoint a friend. But in the same thing, I would appoint one friend and then have a successor in case that friend either doesn't want to or is unable to take on the role of parenting the kids. In, in a case of younger children, you really need to provide some kind of uh, life insurance as well to help them along or else be sure your estate is funded enough because you know, no matter how much your, your sibling loves you and wants to care for the kids, there's, that's a big burden that comes just like that. I know people's lives have been changed by that situation. Yes? Yeah, while you're on the subject of life insurance, okay. um, is it necessary to have life insurance and your, your adult children as beneficiaries, or is that just kind of a waste of money? It's, I, I mean, I think that's more of a personal opinion. Some people get an insurance policy to fund uh, you know, pro costs of probate, uh, different kinds of uh, taxes and so forth. If you, depending on the size of your estate, um, it might be a nice, thoughtful thing to do for kids. You know, then they would get that kind of inheritance. You could, uh, uh, but, you know, that's just more personal choice if you happen to have the money available. I mean, if you've got a whole bunch of equity and housing and it's going to be going to them anyway and you don't want to spend the money, there's other kinds of insurance too. There's, you know, disability insurance, health insurance that raise a lot of uh, cost issues as we grow older too. So, you know, you're going to have to weigh in balance what you can do there. Okay. So, all right, yes? Uh, another concern might be for one deferred income account. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, for all different kinds of things, there's some fancy things you can do with IRAs and with 401k plans um, and, and incorporate them. You have to kind of get your overall estate plan and think about how the uh, retirement funds are going to be handled with regards to kids. There are some different things you can regard. Typically, a retirement fund does not go through your estate planning, your trust, because they already have a beneficiary laid out. Just like life insurance, unless you make the trust a beneficiary, will go straight to the beneficiaries and not through the probate process or not through your trust. It is, however, part of your estate. Um, okay, so there's different kind of um, assets. Are under 18? Okay, if you have beneficiaries who, who are not 18 uh, and you don't appoint anybody to manage their property, someone will be appointed to help with that. And you probably want to pick that person yourself. You know, I mean, we all sort of have a chosen person. You might want to be taking care of your kids if you're not able to do that. So that's a... You know, you don't want to put off that choice. I think actually with young kids, it's important, at least during that period that they're below 18, have, a, have some kind of a plan in place to protect their interests and, and you know, uh, not to get into a bad situation. Um, now, what is a, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Just one more question on that. So if I set up a bank account in trust for my minor child, mm -hmm. and God forbid within the next five years something happens to me, mm -hmm. what happens to that money? Well, it would be in trust for the, for the child, uh, but I'm just saying that the child wouldn't be able to take that money out and go rent an apartment and live alone. I mean, they're going to need some kind of supervision. So um, although that money would be theirs, it would be uh, not just given to them outright at age 14 or something. You'd need someone appointed or some kind of a... Uh, typically, you know, the court would probably appoint a family member. Um, to act. To, to, as, as there's two different things. You want someone to take care of the physical child and then also someone to take care of the money related to the child, uh, you know, cost of education, feeding, housing, and, uh, you know, sometimes you want that to be the same person, sometimes you don't. So, but um, typically you need to address who's going who's gonna to step into those shoes, you know, because you don't want to be uh, just having that money go right out at that age would not be used properly. Yes? Yeah, there's different things. There's like a payable on death account. There's a few different ways that you can talk to your banker and they can structure accounts. There's a lot of books out. Like one of them is, I think, uh, How to Avoid Probate. Know, without having to deal with all the nasty lawyers. And what, what you want to do is, that, you know, I think they recommend get all your property in joint tenancy, so it just goes right over. Um, they may recommend the payable on death accounts, the uh, you know, transfer on death accounts. You put your cars, there's a way on the DMV you can put someone's name as receiving your car. And in theory, you could get rid of your entire estate that way. Uh, there's always going to be something you forget and that would end up going through uh, intestate succession or something. Generally, I wouldn't recommend trying to segregate all your assets and just have them transfer over to people. But there, I mean, you know, that's something you can talk to your bank about and find a little account that you set up with a life insurance policy so it does go straight to a beneficiary. Yeah? Since you nominated beneficiary on, on any uh, savings account, would you have to include it in the living trust then? Um, well, you don't have to, but if you want it to go through your trust, um, then you can transfer your accounts into the trust. Let me try to explain a little bit more about uh, the trust and how t wills and trusts works, and then it may, may make a little more sense. First of all, with the will, um, a will can, you know, name your executor, uh, name who you want, collecting your assets, selling off whatever's going to be needed to pay your debts, and then distributing the rest to your beneficiaries. That's under court supervision. There are some benefits to probate. The, the court will supervise the distribution, um, the look over things. There's a lot of people who spend a lot of time looking over who's totaling up the amounts and making sure everything balances. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in, in probate, the only problem is that 
typically you have to get an attorney to handle it. I think you know it, it is possible to go through the process by yourself and probate a will and so forth or have an executor probate the will, but typically you're really going to need an attorney. There's a lot of little deadlines, a lot of little convoluted uh, things you have to work with. And it sort of is a self-propagating system there. Um, with regards to a living trust, um, you can avoid uh, such an extensive, uh, costly, and lengthy uh, process because a living trust is basically a contract between you and the trustee with a set of instructions as to how you want your things divvied up, how you want them organized, how you want them controlled, if you want maybe a payout at age 25 to your children and then another payout at age 35 and then the rest at some later date. A living trust is a little bit more flexible. During your life you can amend it as things change. You can amend um, the beneficiaries, change uh, the instructions and so forth. So it's a revocable situation. Um, there were also some uh, benefits to, oh, and, and if, as an aside, if your estate is such that it is in California less than $100,000, you're going to have some other ways to uh, sort of avoid the probate process. But I think generally, if you've got a house in California and you have a will, it's going to go through probate because most houses are worth more than $100,000 here. Most mobile homes are worth more. I mean, it's it just very costly here in California. Um, <clears throat> now, typically, you have some choices to make in both the situation of a will and a trust. Who are you going to name? What kind of person are you going to name to handle your affairs, to be the executor, to be the trustee? Okay, if you're a married couple or a registered domestic partnership or anything like that, you're going to want um, most likely your partner or your spouse to be the trustee if you die. And then they can manage it and you know, enforce your wishes and so forth and make your distributions and take care of things. Initially, though, I recommend putting yourself as the trustee because then you can change things as you go along. It's a little bit more flexible uh, document. Um, now, there is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of these trust mills that go around. There's sort of some terms that always come up. They kind of describe the trust as a great big basket. It's woven with your instructions, and you put things into the basket. Once you, you know, create this trust document, you grab your house, you put it in there. This is called funding. Um, and you, you take your cars and you put it in the trust. And then it's full. If you don't do that, if you don't first draft the trust and then fund it with your assets, the trust is no good. So unfortunately, sometimes you go to these trust uh, seminars um, where it's sort of a one-size-fits-all trust and, you know, it's 2500 bucks. Here's, here's your trust document. They say, well, go home and fund it. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Well, then you have to spend some time at the recorder's office. You've got to go contact your brokerage accounts. You've got to transfer deeds over. And frankly, a lot of us don't do that. So. If you go and you're working with an attorney, you want to make sure that they at least do the initial funding or explain to you how to do that, whether it's go talk to your bank person and figure out how to change the name on all your accounts. Because a lot of the little paperwork you want included when you get that trust set up initially. Yes? What about, don't you usually have a rollover bill or that, it's, Right. As I like to say, let's say the day before you die, you win the lottery, okay, and you haven't had time to take that money and put it in the trust. Then you have a, something called a pour-over will, or I guess you could call it a rollover will, same sort of idea there. And basically, it's a simplified will that you really need to do with every trust, and it just rolls over everything into the trust. It goes through probate, though. So you're going to still be paying a percentage to the probate administration, but at least it gets into the trust, and then it gets distributed so that's why, typically, even if you have a trust, take a look at it every year. Probably have an attorney just skim over it, answer some questions of yourself. Hey, have I bought any new property? Have I, uh, have I bought any um, you know, new vehicles? Have I opened a few more savings accounts, got a couple more brokerage accounts, something? You need to kind of look at these things as you go along to make sure they're properly funded. Otherwise, it's not going to work. A lot of people, they move once or twice, and they change homes. All of a sudden, you've got this great trust. Nothing's in it. So, go on. What about if you have a trust and you want to just get rid of it and start all over again? 
that's fine. <laughs> you do a, a revocation, you get rid of it. Um, you, there's some standard language that usually, you know, especially I think you may have even heard it, people hear it more with wills, you know, I hereby revoke all prior wills wherever they may be done or whatever. Um, and it's sort of the same idea with the trust. You want to get rid of the old one and start fresh. Sometimes that's even simpler than uh, trying to amend, although you can do different amendments too. Yes? Uh, a question about that. What's the difference between a revocable and irrevocable trust? All right. Um, nine, Ninety-nine percent of people are going to want to get into a revocable trust. Revocable means you can change it while you're li alive. It's an inter vivos trust during your lifetime. It gives you a lot more control. Um, irrevocable trusts are more for um, when you're really getting into some uh, maybe uh, uh, complex tr uh, tax saving maneuvers. I know in, in Nevada there's some offshore trusts that are irrevocable because then you get tax benefits because you really can't get at the property. It becomes, you know, it's no longer yours to access. So there's, that's irrevocable. Um, you know, th they're not very common. And in general garden variety, you know, what you're going to need to to handle a death or, or your estate plan, you're going to be looking at a revocable trust. And then it gives you more flexibility. You know, you can change things as you go along. So, yes? What kind of, it's, I was the, um Trustee, I guess, of a trust. Okay. From a parent. And there didn't seem to be any oversight at all. And I was really conscious that I was doing everything correctly and having a turn when I wanted to distribute the money. Just so there'd be no question about my accounting. Yeah. If I hadn't chosen to do that, it just seems like I didn't have to follow the positions at all. And what if you say you have a a trustee and you're giving money to nonprofit organizations and that's written up. There, there seems to be no uh, control of the trust to, to ascertain if that's being presented. Well, uh, it, that's true. It's a lot less supervision. Um, a trust, if it's going on for any length of time, you know, would be paying taxes as its own entity. But, um, yeah, there's a lot less supervision there. Uh, the administration is much more abbreviated. You have to have faith in your trustee a lot more. Beneficiaries may have trouble, and uh, there's some language in a trust you can include to allow them to, you know, take a look at different things or expect different kinds of accountings. But some people see that as a benefit too, though, because it simplifies the whole process. Um, but you've got to trust who you're entrusting your things to, you know. So, but yes. You, You can uh, basically, as long as it's funded, it's going to work for you. Um, oh, well, that's up to the, what, what you include in the trust document. Let's say you have a child. Oh, let's say you have a child with some kind of uh, problem, uh, alcoholism or, or, or some kind of a drug problem, and you want to keep it monitored for 15, 20 years, whatever, in terms of, you know, we don't want a lot of distributions going out here. Um, except for, say, housing, um, medical bills, that kind of thing, uh, for a long period of time, then your trustee would administer and keep that trust going while certain things were handled over a long period of years. If the trust was a simple payout trust, it would just be something where you just collect all the assets, you pay the, de uh, pay the, uh, the, the debtors or the creditors, and uh, you know, wrap it up. Most of the time you mention a time frame. I mean, because just realistically, you're going to be either wanting everybody to, you know, you have adult children, you just want uh, that all paid off, or you have a friend, you just want, you know, let's, let's uh, have my executor or my uh, trustee um, collect all my stuff, pay my bills, and make the distributions, and, you know, give my clock to so-and-so and this over here, and, and we're done. Can, can anybody be a successive trustee? You can appoint whoever you want. And sometimes they may ask about it. They may even make you run down with your, certi your uh, certificate of trust and show it's a trust. But, um, you know, in some states you kind of have to record the certificate of trust as well. But here, it shouldn't be a problem, but you have to address that issue and just put no taxes due all over it. Okay. So, Thank you. Okay, you?
please. I have a question about property. If, if you were to add, my mother's 84 and my brother's 40, and he can be living in the house. Okay. Forever. Yeah. Um, and then the person that Depends what her goal is. I mean, a lot of people put their child on as a joint tenant, okay? Um, however, that means that the other tenant could, per or the joint tenant, either one of them could probably go down to a real estate office and sever the joint tenancy, and now they're both equal owners and maybe, play, you know, deed his half to somebody else unrelated. So. There's different things. I wouldn't necessarily do that. I'd probably think it'd be simpler, especially if there's other siblings involved, to just do a will or something where you set forth who you want to get so she doesn't lose her ownership of that property. Now, um, depending on how much it's worth, depending on what the estate size is, in a case where it's just one house and there's nothing else and you know it's a small thing and everybody's happy with that, maybe a joint tenancy would be the way to go. But then again, that would go to the person the joint tenant on the death of one of the parties. Fully, with outside of a will, boom. Okay, yeah. I know by adding somebody to your deed, if, like, you want to go do a refinance, mm -hmm. they put their name in mm -hmm. when you're going to do a refinance. Sure. If they have a judgment against them, mm -hmm. it actually goes against your property. So how can you mm. ask somebody for, say you have no children, Right. I, I mean, I don't think you really can. I mean, play that game. I think so. A will or trust, you end up keeping the control, but then again, if you die, it'll go to who you want it to go to. If you um, change your mind during your life, you still own the property and you can give it to somebody else. Because, I mean, a lot of things where you have friends coming in and living with you and they seem wonderful at first, and that's actually one of the things you get into with the you know, elder abuse situations, too, because a lot of times it, the relationship starts out wonderful. Someone's in there taking care of you and helping and everything else, and then suddenly deeds start getting transferred and names start getting added and counts start getting emptied and you have to be careful and I think the independence of having your name on those deeds and then your will taking care of and giving it to whoever and I'm not saying don't give it to that person who's caring for you I'm just saying be careful and know that you're giving something away if you, if you put their name on your property um, I mean there's a lot of situations like that where even people come in and start using somebody else's credit and you know it's, it's not very nice so yes Okay, um, a lot of times when you buy a home, the broker or the real estate people, the escrow agent always puts things in joint tenancy. I, I'm not really sure why. Um, tenants in common means you both own a certain percentage of the property. Let's say there's three people and they all own a house. They each own 33%. They can do whatever they want with it. They can sell it to somebody else. They can they can own their portion of it, they can will away their 33%. If you own it as joint, um, then you, if the other people are going to die first, well, I mean, first of all, typically it's with two people. If, if the other person dies, you get it. It doesn't go through a will. If you die, they get it. If it's tenants in common, you can take your half or your third or your fifth and distribute it to your friend, Jane, or, or your kids. That's your interest. Um, I'm more comfortable, I think, probably with a tenancy in common. Let's just get it all out there. And I, you know, I'm just, there's a lot of things with joint tenancy that you get into a situation where then if you want to change anything later, it's, it's not as easy. Now, if you've been married forever and you, know, and you have a joint tenancy with your spouse, that's great. But by the same token, um, they have something else called community property with rights of survivorship, which is a little bit uh, better. So, go on. Yeah. Um, for 
I would drafted by somebody. You indicate what you want uh, the trust to say, who you want to be the. You need a few different things. The trust is a separate legal document. The different documents here we've talked about today. You got your advanced health care directive. And typically when I do a little binder for estate planning, it comes in you know, a little leatherette binder with your name on it. There's usually some pages of informal lists of uh, your, your documents, where your, where your safety deposit box is, all that kind of stuff. Then there'll be a document in there called the living trust. It will indicate who you want to be your trustee. It'll indicate how you want the minor kids handled. It'll indicate um, uh, what kind of payouts you want towards whom. It'll indicate uh, there'll be a, a, an attachment to it indicating what things you intend to put into the trust, your house, your brokerage account, your cars, whatever, um, and how you just want it administered, uh, what kind of restrictions you want on the trustee, and so forth. It's basically just sort of a contract. Uh, then you have a pour over will, which is basically kind of the backup thing in case you forget to fund something. In case you have a trust, you know, most likely with your situation, you probably have a pour over will that will put something back into the trust. That's, that should be done. And if it's not done, you should get one. But um, pour over will is another document that puts stuff in the trust. Um, then you have your durable power of attorney for property management. That was the thing I was talking about, incapacity, who's going to write your checks, and so forth. Then you have your health care directive. There's other little things you're going to need, the deeds, to the trust transfer deeds of taking your property and putting it in the trust, uh, assignment of your timeshare rights, assignment of your, your uh, uh, the partnership rights, or your, maybe your corporate, if you have a little corporation, you want to be sure that your documents get into the trust, the corporation gets into the trust. Um, so basically there's ways of funding all these different things, that, you know, your, your country club membership, you get that assigned into the trust. So your estate binder ends up looking like this, and it has all those little deeds or assignments of rights, a list of all your personal property in your house saying it's going into the trust so it can be administered by the trustee. And um, that's basically what it is. In terms of how do you draft a trust, they have some software programs, they have some books out, oh, do this yourself. Um, I think when you're getting into a trust, you probably want a lawyer in there. Um, Oh, a certificate of trust is basically a document that sometimes works uh, to indicate that you have a trust. You can show it to, say, if you're going in to refinance or you're going in to buy a home. So you don't, it indicates, you know, uh, basically the powers of the trustee and that you have a trust and, and who's sort of going to be operating it. You can show it to the, say, the real estate person or the, when you're buying a house or if you're buying some commercial building or something. And they should not need to look at the entire trust. They should just accept that document. Now, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, sometimes they want to see the whole trust, but typically they should accept that in lieu of the trust. It gives you a little bit more privacy. That's the other difference between probating a will and administering a trust. Because, you know, they say that there's three problems with probate. One is expensive. And it is. On the, uh, on the blue sheets I gave you, it indicates the percentages break down. You know, basically it can be about 4% of your estate. And if you're dealing with $100,000, I mean, you can do the math, or 400000 you start paying a lot in, in costs of probate. Probate's lengthy, usually longer than administering a trust. And also you have the um, factor that it's public. Sometimes that's not that big a deal. I mean, who cares where your stuff goes or whatever? But sometimes it is a big deal. And also, uh, you know, genealogists spend a lot of time digging through death records and, and will records. And if you've ever read a family tree, half of it's about who gave what to whom when. And so some, there is a public record made, whereas in a, a trust, it's, it's not so public. Same thing with a conservatorship proceeding. If you don't have somebody appointed for you and you're getting on in age and, and you, things are just harder in terms of, uh, you know, taking care of the paperwork, writing all the bills. I mean, it just takes you hours and hours and hours. You want somebody to handle it for you. And let's say maybe your kid wants to come in and say, listen, you know, mom, all these bills aren't getting paid. Let me help you out. 
you need to have that taken care of. You don't want to go into a situation where you're going to have to go into, court, into a courtroom and you've let it go so far that then someone's going to be trying to declare you incompetent in a public room. It's, it's a humiliating process for both the child who's trying to help and the adult who maybe has just let things slip at that point. So that's something to think about in advance to, to prevent the public situation. But go on. I'd have to check with, there's some basic stuff. We've got some no low press books on how to create a trust okay. and wills, powers of attorney, medical directive. Yeah, NOLO is not a bad resource. It's, it's at least gets you uh, a lot of the information uh, to you, and then you can kind of cut through some of the, uh, you know, attorney time and such. But go on. Yeah. Now, with all the trust and the wills that we're talking about, what is um, such a big difference in the holographic will if you were to be detailed in the explanation of how you want all of your assets to be taken care of? Taken care of if you trust the person who is really going to be in charge of your assets once you do pass away, what is, what is the legal ramification? I mean, of a holographic will? Up, yeah, would it, would it stand up in a court of law as well as maybe a trust? If, it, if you trusted the person that you were trusting all your assets to and you wrote it out into detailed description just like you were talking about. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily try to do a holographic trust. I don't think that would fly very well, but um, a holographic will is actually kind of a, an interesting idea, even as a, you know, as a law student when you study them. They do work. Um, the problem is that sometimes you leave something out or you don't date it the right way or you sign it in the wrong place or something. You'd have to really be careful with the the statute, you'd look in the, uh, the code section, look in the statute specifically dealing with holographic wills. It's just not a, uh, a great way to go. I think there's some <coughs> very basic wills on the internet, especially in California, that you can find that may be a little more useful than that. But, um, I mean, you have to write everything out in your own handwriting. Uh, sometimes, See, attorneys end up thinking in kind of skewed ways. You know, we th we're always thinking of all these things that can go wrong. And if you're just thinking common sense, right, you may put these things out, but then there may be people who are trying to misinterpret it. So that's just another problem with holographic wills. You may not have thought of somebody coming in here and saying, well, I thought you meant, you know, my three sons. I didn't think you meant my three sons by my first marriage or whatever. You know, I mean, they'll just interpret it slightly differently, and that's, that's a problem with it. But it depends, yeah. But in order to make an amendment to a living trust, do you need anything besides a notary, uh, a notary certification? A notary? Notarizing the amendment? Well, you need an uh, amendment drafted up that fits in with your trust. You need to get it notarized. Um, in terms of whether you were going to do that yourself and amend your own trust, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. I'd probably want somebody to read over what you have and do that. But in theory, you just need to draft an amendment. And even in some of those no-low guides, if you want to go that route, they probably address that. Well, but that's what I mean. Do you have to rewrite the whole thing? You don't, no, no, no. You'd, an amendment is just, see, that's what actually on an annual basis, some people change who they want as beneficiaries, who they want listed. Uh, the house is gone, so you're going to be addressing funding issues and also maybe changes in your life that require an amendment. Typically, you know, it can be like a little paragraph that you don't have to write the whole thing. You refer to the paragraph and the trust you want to amend, kind of relates back. So, all right, go over here. Yes? Are there people that, that are business-minded, say par paralegals, other than, say, attorneys, so that, mm -hmm. that can help a trustee that you may really trust but that's not business-oriented? Say if you have a lot of property involved and things like that. You want to give the trustee assistance in administering yeah, the trust? by the hour, by the <coughs> To help a trustee. You could uh, probably go to a paralegal service or something like that and get assistance that way, especially if you're the trustee, um, you're going to need some advice either through, uh, you know, maybe an accountant or a tax person or uh, something. That, that is typically done, like accountants or... Yeah, I mean, you, you would be 
uh, you know, most likely the trust would indicate that you'd be refunded for whatever expenses you might incur for doing that. Um, because, you know, uh, there's certain exposure to being a trust for the trust. You don't want to, for instance, uh, misinterpret the provisions and walk off with the money and then have the beneficiaries sue you. So there are different things you can do. Typically, you're allowed to do those things in the trust and you'll get refunded for that. So, yes. I know a lot of you are here on a lunch hour, so it is 1 o'clock. Did you have oh. something else you needed to cover real quick? Or do you, want to I, you know, I think, I think we covered uh, pretty, much, uh, you know, pretty much the basics here. Um, I would just say that, uh, you know, basically taking the first step and thinking about this issue is, is the important part. A lot of people put it off forever. I mean, they just put it off, and that's an important thing to take care of, and it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to take care of. You're, you're helping out who you leave behind. So it's good you came and to start thinking about it. So. Could you give us in the ballpark about what this um, process would cost in terms of spending on trust in terms of setting up the entire package of these trusts? Well, you know what? I don't really do a, a one size fits all yeah. trust. They, uh, you know, some of those places charge a couple grand and they do this one size fits all trust. Depending on if you already have your health care directive, if you already have this or that, we would work within that. Um, you know, for, for a married couple with, with uh, you know, a smaller estate, it would be, you know, uh, less than $2,000. For, for a married couple with a larger estate, it would probably just be around that price or a little over. It really depends. It's hard to pinpoint it. Wills are cheaper when you make them. But then again, if you have two people, for instance, and you want them each to have a will, that can almost get up as much as doing a regular trust package. Um, and a trust package includes a pour over will as well. In, in terms of a will, you can be cheaper now, but then in probate, if you're looking at paying 20000 extra in probate costs down the line, maybe the, maybe the you know, $1,800 you spend now on a trust or the $2,000 you spend now is cheaper in the long run. I mean, they have, on the Internet, sometimes you can see breakdowns of uh, the statutory probate costs, and, and they get up there pretty fast. So, yeah. Or, when you plan, if you want to look in the phone book or something for an attorney, do they list if their specialty is trust? Yeah, there's a section even in the Grass Valley uh, phone book that will list who does mainly um, trust and estates. Uh, you know, I have a background in, in general civil litigation as well and some elder abuse cases and so forth. And, um, you know, and then I've gotten more transactional and more trust oriented as, as my career has progressed. So, yes. Do you also review uh, existing trust? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's. And that's you charge hourly wage? Is that what you do? Yeah. And, and that's certainly something that you can negotiate in terms of whether you want a flat rate or you want an hourly rate. If I'm doing a trust binder for someone, I usually char I'll, I'll get an idea after. Uh, my first meeting is a free consultation. So you come in, we talk about what you might need. Do you need a will? Do you just need a trust package? If it's a whole package, I usually give you a flat rate and do the initial funding. Um, if it's just, you know, reviewing it, spending a couple hours looking over what you got, seeing if there's any holes in it, seeing if you funded it all, you know, that would be cheaper on an hourly rate. So, typically, it's about 225 an hour. So, yes. Any anybody else have questions or? Okay. Okay. Right, right. Um, but there's an understanding from my sister that she's the one that's going to care for my kids should something happen to my husband and my son. Uh -huh. Now, if I don't get around to that paperwork yet, should something happen to us tomorrow, with her understanding this, do you still have to go to court to get an order from the Yeah. So it's taking care of it ahead of time alleviates that court yeah, process? Yeah, it alleviates mm -hmm. some of that. Um, and it gives it the papers. Here's the papers short process you get appointed you know okay. this is their intent boom unless there's some reason unless your sister's in you know in the pokey or something at that time and they don't want to appoint her you know it, it's a very uh, they're going to do what you want okay. okay but wouldn't they do what I want anyway if the whole most likely was most likely but it's just a matter of the court process the hearing and right uh, although with regards to it's hard to explain what happens in case of a death, 
but people end up fighting over stuff you had no idea they're going to fight over. For all you know, you know, your mother or your your, your mother-in-law or something thinks the kid should be has has gotten irritated with your sister and thinks the kid should be more you know different environment or blah blah blah. So then they could come in and try to play around with that. Writing a letter of intent's a good idea. That something. Was my next yeah. I just put something in writing. You can put. Intent. You can write that. Um, and it might, the court may take it into consideration, but it's not, a, it's not a guarantee. I mean, you should probably get that assigned either in a will or something. Typically, you put who you want as guardian in the will, so. But. Gives it more relevancy, but it's not going to be solid. I mean, it's not going to be hard and fast. I mean, a lot of it depends on your relationship with your family. Most of the time, a court will... I mean, having your sister be it would probably be the most reasonable thing to do, especially if everybody's in agreement over that. So most likely a court would do that. But if somebody came out of the woodwork saying your sister was a, a no good some, something or other and somebody else wants to take over the process, you know, then you're going to have a hearing and legal fees. Whereas if you just have a situation set up where she's the, you know, she's the one in charge in your will or she's the one in charge of the kids the property management and and the guardian of the person it's a done deal so okay anything else with uh, yes usually you do the uh, that's usually the way it works. And then after you sell it, um, you need to put whatever you, if you buy a new house, you need to put that one in. It does go back and forth, but again. Or your, or your assets from the state. Right. Um, doing the actual filing of the trust transfer deed is, you know, usually 15 bucks or something mm -hmm. uh, in terms of actual paperwork costs. So it's probably worth it and then just pull it out and put it back in. Typically the escrow people will pull it out for you when you're signing all that paperwork and you know they're going to get you on your... Are you talking about the escrow? Right. They're going to do that. They'll probably charge you the 10 bucks at that point but you know it's well worth the, uh, the worry because you know property doesn't sell immediately. You know so there's always a problem with that. So yeah. One quick question. Can a, a beneficiary of a trust could also be the successor trustee? Yeah, you can, have, like, for instance, a lot of people will have their spouse, and that person is probably going to be the beneficiary. Um, there's something called an AB trust, which helps with taxes between married couples and so forth, and you typically have your spouse be the trustee after you die. Let's say, you know, you're the trustee initially of your stuff or of the trust, then your spouse is trustee, and in actuality, sometimes they will manage your section of the trust that has become irrevocable on your death and their section of the trust. It kind of divides into two pieces at that point and uh, there are some helpful tax benefits to doing it that way. But typically um, they will be benefiting from all the property and so therefore they're both, they wear both hats. They're beneficiaries and the uh, trustee. But there is no legal conflict of having both having it No, you don't have to go outside the family or go outside your beneficiary circle because, I mean, typically, you know, you'll have, let's say you want your son or uh, they're going to end up receiving the money or maybe distributing it to their siblings, whoever's. You know, the, the, the uh, way that is kind of monitored would be, let's say you had one child be the trustee and all the other kids were not the trustee, but let's say they had to divide it up into four pieces and give a piece to everybody, but let's say your trustee son decided to get greedy and just started taking extra stuff. All those other beneficiaries could, in theory, go after him and make sure it was done properly. Um, you only have one beneficiary. Not a problem, yeah. Yeah, not a problem, so. Anything else, or, okay. When you have a existing maybe trust and, and my parents had an existing trust. Mm -hmm. um, my father died, so the attorney recommended that they 
take him out of the trust and make my mother the sole living trust? Mm -hmm. Do you have to do that, or is that something that you think would hold it all? Well, I'm not sure exactly what that situation was, but typically if you're, if your dad was probably the trustee and your mom was a trustee at the same time. When he passed away, he's no longer serving as a trustee, uh, and your, your mom is the trustee only. Um, depending on whether or not that property just transferred over completely to your mom or whether it was set up in a sort of a tax saving situation there, um, she's basically the only trustee living. She may have her own successor trustee, which might be somebody else in the family. There should obviously be someone else appointed to handle the trust after she's gone if there's any reason the trust will, you know, keep, I mean, for someone to manage the trust when she dies. Um, and I assume there must be a successor trustee. But I think that was just probably the logistics that your, your dad was no longer a, a part of the trust. I mean, I mean, he was a part of it. He just was no longer in a managing capability at that point, so. There are some, uh, there's something called a, a, a sort of a marital deduction trust or a, it's called a, uh, you know, a, 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 just like a, a, I'm drawing a blank right now, an AB trust. It, it, it does, like for instance, if you die and your wife gets your assets, all right, then her estate gets really big. Because both, let's in California, you each own half of your stuff. It's community property, all right? Okay, the husband dies, everything, the wife's estate's really big. All right, then, I mean, hopefully, it's, it's higher than the, the taxable amount, which is varying. You know, this year it's $2 million for a couple of years, and it goes up to 3.5, but then after that, it's going to be unlimited for one year, and then it's going to go back down to a million. And frankly, that could be a house. That's some congressional thing that's going on. They're trying to encourage people to come up with new legislation, but if they don't, we're going to be back to a million as your, your taxable uh, exclusion there. And in that case, let's say the state's worth one and a half million dollars, dad dies, it goes over to the mom. Now her estate's the full million and a half. When it goes on to the kids, they're going to be paying taxes on that. Whereas if they did an AB trust, so when the dad died, there, or, you know, or however that worked, his trust became irrevocable. It was, it was just a done deal. Your mom was able to take out things to live with. Um, then his trust, trust, after she dies, just passes on to the kids. Her trust is then worth less money and maybe goes underneath the taxable amount. It saves tax dollars. That's the theory with that. Different things, though, because your, your dad's portion of the trust does become irrevocable, and your mom can only get you know, health, education, maintenance, uh, kind of same lifestyle you're, you're involved in. You, you're not going to be, you know, funding a great big business with that, or your mom won't be at that point, or just using it. It's, it's sort of funneled straight to the, uh, the children, or however that would work. So, okay. To the question, uh, since we're talking about the uh, capital gain, the, uh, the, tax, the inheritance tax going back to $1 million in uh -huh. 2010, Right. Would you recommend a uh, family limited partnership then? Or um, the first question is, do you do family limited partnerships? I mean, I'll, I'll do LLCs and little partnerships and things like that. I would have to, you start getting a little bit, uh, it's hard to give a, a, an analysis of your particular situation here, but an LLC, different things like that are, is a possible thing. I'd have to really take a look or a limited partnership. That's, some people do them to, to help. Is there an FLP or, or an LLC? Well, I'm more comfortable with, with LLCs right now. I do more work with them, but I'm not, I, I'd have to take a look at what, what you have going there. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, circumventing tax situations, that would require a good hard look at what you have and what you're going to be facing. Because you don't want to make it too complicated either, you know. Um, Yes, they're two separate organizations. Yeah. My understanding was when you create the FLP, that you can also undervalue the uh, total amount of your assets of your property. For example, if your total assets are $2 million, 
when you create DFLP, suddenly since you have about 40% discount on that, suddenly you can actually transfer uh, $3 million instead of $2 million without paying the American mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I'd have to, again, I'd have to just take a, a good hard look at what the FLP is based on and what the assets were that are going into it before giving the opinion on that particular thing. Yeah. So if you have a trust, then all your bank accounts, your checking accounts, stock funds, CDs, mm -hmm. all be, would all be in the trust. In the name of yeah, they, you, your little checkbooks come with the so-and-so family trust or the so-and-so trust on it, written written at the top, if you're careful enough to put them all in there. Some so people forget, be, yes. Purpose, right, right. You should put everything in the trust. Yeah, with the stocks, typically if you have a brokerage account, they can take care of most of that. You just need, you know, some instructional letters to the to the brokerage account, and they take care of the individual uh, stock certificates and so forth so at their end. If it's just held on, in your name, you're going to have to use the pour over will, but then that goes through probate and kind of defeats the, your if intention. It's over, it, it would only be subject to probate. Over 100,000, yeah, yeah. So you could keep any little things under 100000 Yeah, but then you're going to be, be spending some attorney fees at some point mm -hmm. in being sure that those things wind up in the trust. You're going it, it, to, and it's better to do it now if you can, but. But I'm interested because sometimes you change those. Things. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a trust, and, and do I have my, my grocery account in there right now? No, I mean, typically it's, you know, yeah. less than $1,000 in there, but, you know, I should, but. Um, you know, you have to keep up with that. If you open a new bank account, you should just open it in the name of the trust. But, you know, you try to get as much as you can there. You try to get your, your home, the, the good items in there right away. And you realize that if you don't put the little ones in there, you're going to be paying somebody to do that, or somebody's going to be paying somebody to do that later. It's no more cumbersome. It shouldn't be. Uh, you may have some raised eyebrows or something with the checks you're depositing or something from time to time, but it's, it's, it shouldn't be a problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. You could just go empty that, yeah. I could just empty mm -hmm. that. So then what would be left is probably not very much stuff. Yeah. Except, well, there would be a couple uh, insurance policies that are zero because you borrowed against them. Mm -hmm. And so basically, what, what would I do when say, she dies today? What would I do? Collect, collect. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you, uh, you know, you might bring it down to the probate department and just put it on file there in case any creditors show up or something. But, but I think with regards to that, if it's a small enough situation, you'd probably collect all their bills and try to uh, pay them off as best you can, and you know, with whatever's there, because it doesn't sound like there's that much there. Um, in terms of personal items, I mean, in the will she made, are you the executor? Yeah. Yeah, you. There's there is actually a NOLO book on uh, you know administering a trust, uh, you know, and serving as an executor, and I think they may have one that covers them both. Uh, N O L O, and in that situation, you may want to just review that, kind of give you the steps to go through how to collect stuff and what you're dealing with. You can go to Amazon.com and pick it up. Otherwise, yeah, Helen, you said you might have some in there. Yeah. yeah. I think it's called the Executor's Guide. Yeah, and that gives you, uh, yeah, because you know what, that's, usually it's a family member who's never had to deal with this before, and it's, it's a pain in the neck, you know, so. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's a big, I mean, it, to me, that seems like a fairly straightforward situation, but I don't know exactly in terms of, you know, if she has a, $200,000 under the mattress somewhere or anything. I mean, we, you know, uh, that you, you'd have to, you know, but it sounds like you're under that $100,000 limit, and it would be a very abbreviated system of organizing everything and paying it off. And okay, but I would need to go some legal step. I need to go to the probate department and just file it. Is that what you're saying? Probably something like that, yeah. You'd have to take a look into that, and I would just refer you to that guide 
and take a look at the guide and, and, and see what, whether you have to be closing some bank accounts and doing some organizational things as well. So you want to protect yourself and make sure you don't have, you know, uh, bills hounding whoever at that point or make sure you're not, they're not hounding you in your name or anything. So yeah. you want to be careful with that. Oh, okay. All right. So you probably have a, a power of attorney or? Uh-huh. Well, you know what, uh, for your comfort level, pick up, uh, go over to the uh, center and pick up that guide and it'll help you out a little bit, so. We have them available for review or the Grass Valley. Nevada City Libraries have them. Okay, and it's called NOLO. N-O-L-O. NOLO Press. They write a lot of self-help guides. Okay, so. thank you. Sheila, okay. I want to thank you for your time. Okay. That was great. We have been handing out the health care directive that just came. We've got a standard format. So that's what we've been handing out as we go. Good. Um, I appreciate you coming. All right. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.